Welcome to Aqua Assembly God's online service. I'm so glad you decided to join us for our worship service today. You know, in today's time, you can go to any online church that you want, but you decided to join us. Thank you so much. We're so glad that you're with us today. You know, our heart here at Aqua Assembly God is just to help you grow closer to Jesus, help lead you into a life transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that we can do that is when we can connect and engage with each other, when we can kind of build relationships, get to know each other a little bit. And so one of the ways that we do that is through our Digital Connect card. Our online hosts are gonna be putting the link to our Digital Connect card uh, in the chat room below. Would you do me a favor before the service is over, take a moment and fill it out. If this is your first time here, let us know that you're watching. Let us know how we can pray for you. If you've been watching for a while, let us know how we can pray for you too. The Digital Connect card is our way to communicate and talk back and forth. Listen, this is a great way. Any prayer requests you may have, uh, if you wanna join our e-news list or maybe our text messaging list, you can do it through the Digital Connect card. Let us know where you're watching. We would just wanna connect and engage with you best we can. There's so many things happening here at Echo Assembly God and we really hope that you'll jump in and be a part of it. So I wanna share about a brand new Wednesday night Bible study that we're starting this Wednesday night. You can join us from seven to 8.15 
either in person or on Zoom. The best of both worlds. We're going to be going through the prodigal son. It's a phenomenal Bible study. If you've never studied the prodigal son, I mean like really did a little bit of a deep dive into it, man, you do not want to miss this Wednesday night service. And the best part is you can join us in person at the church or you can join us on Zoom. We'll have a study guide and everything ready for you to go. Now listen, this is why you need to sign in that digital connect card because that's how you get into the e-news, which is how we send out the Zoom information. So make sure you do that. And also, as you know, Memorial Day is coming up, the unofficial start of summer. Well, the May 30th, Sunday, May 30th, we're having a special Memorial Day worship service at 1030. We'll really hope you'll join us. We're going to be celebrating Memorial Day, have a special treat at the church, and also celebrate those who've given their life for our freedoms. And then Monday on Memorial Day, Waterford Township, the township that our church is in, is having a Memorial Day parade. And we're going to participate. It's going to be so much fun. Listen, we would love to have you join us. Here's what we're going to do. The uh, American Legion is sponsoring this parade, and we're going to put up on the screen right now a flyer. They've got a lot of different activities for a bike contest. Uh, They're going to have a chicken barbecue afterwards. But here's how we're going to participate. They're having a parade. We're going to gather at the American Legion on Echo Ave at 8 a.m., and we're going to line up, and we're going to have a section just for our church. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a truck. We're going to have a little float. You can join us. You can ride in the truck. You can ride on the float if you like. You can stand and, and wave to people if you like. Now, we're really hoping for a lot of people to come out because I challenged my church. If they come out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dress like Uncle Sam and I'm going to ride my Harley in front of the truck and the float. So that'll be a lot of fun. I really hope you'll join us. And you can join us in, in a couple different ways. You can just join us by being a part of the parade route. Just jump in and watch the parade. You can join us by being in the truck with us or maybe being on the float with us. If you want to do that, we just need you to wear something patriotic, something red, white, and blue, just something fun, and we'll let you join us. We'd love to have you. Hopefully, we can give out some candy or give out Frisbees to the kids or something. Or maybe you have a motorcycle or maybe a, 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 a collect a car, a hot car, muscle car or something, maybe a, a convertible, and you want to ride with us. Come on, we've got some banners, we got some, we'll have a bunch of extra flags, or you can decorate your own vehicle. It's just gonna be a lot of fun. Come on out, we'll be gathering at 8 a.m. The parade will start about 8.45, and then we're gonna take about a mile route for the parade, uh, and we're gonna be going to the local cemetery where we'll be having a Memorial Day service for those who've given their life. So it's just gonna be a lot of fun, an opportunity for us to come out and to be a blessing to our community and to be a part of what God's doing in our community. So we'll hope you'll join us. And also, I want to say thank you so much for being faithful in your tithes and offerings. Thank you for being faithful to the Lord and giving your tithe, the tenth, to Him. You know, God's been doing some great things, and I'm thankful for you for participating and being a part in it. There's three ways you can give. You can give your check by mail. You can give online, or you can also give by downloading our church app, churchcenter.com finding Echo Assembly God and getting linked up that way. All of those ways are secure. That's how actually I give now. I give through our church app. So hopefully you'll join us and you'll show that you love God, you trust Him with everything that you have. And today we're continuing our sermon series. Actually, we're not continuing. We are continuing, but we're wrapping up our sermon series on what is the gospel. Danny, our youth pastor, is going to be sharing the word, and he's going to be blessing you. I know you're going to be blessed as you watch. So let's take a moment, let's pray, and let's ask God to move during this during his words. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for the many blessings in our life. Father, we pray that you would just speak through Danny as he gets into your word and delivers your word. Father, open our hearts and our minds. May we be like sponges this morning where we soak up your presence and we soak up your word. Move in our life. Draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and enjoy the service.
Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm so glad that you're able to listen in. Today we're wrapping up uh, this series that we've been in the last couple weeks, trying to answer this question. Uh, the question being, what is the gospel? Um, and the past couple weeks, uh, we've been looking at different truths, different truths that just kind of summarize what the gospel is. Uh, we've been looking at these four specific ones, God, man, Jesus, and response. And today to kind of wrap up the whole series and wrap up answering this question, what is the gospel? We're going to be looking at and focusing in on the power of the gospel. But before we even go into the details of that, I just have a quick question for you. Have you ever, and just kind of think through, once I ask this question for you personally, but have you ever had a moment in your life when maybe it was hiking, maybe it was driving, maybe you happened to be on a beach, whatever the situation might be, but have you ever seen a view so beautiful, a view so breathtaking that it just captivated you? Like it was a moment that you couldn't just help but pause. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to go down to Guatemala to be able to celebrate a friend of mine who was getting married and I was in, I was one of his groomsmen in his wedding. And I remember when he was getting married, the venue that he was in was located outside of Guatemala City, the capital city. And I remember when I got to the venue, there was so many things to do that day. There were so many things that the groomsmen just had to kind of come together and tackle and try to get done for him for his special day. But when I got there, I remember just walking up to the venue and seeing this view that just took my breath away. And just really quick, look, this is the view right here on the side, on, on, on the cliff on the side of Guatemala City. It may not seem like much in the picture, but it just took my breath away so much. I tried to use like the panoramic option, the panel option on my iPhone, and I tried to catch like the whole view, but it wouldn't do it justice. It's a whole view of the capital city. There was all these mount these huge hills, kind of like mountains in the background. There was some inactive volcanoes in the background. It was just beautiful, breathtaking, just the fresh wind like hitting against me when I was standing there. It's one of those moments that I just kind of stood there and for a second just felt so small and was just in awe. I, I was just staring at this beautiful view. I was in awe for a moment and I couldn't help but think to myself, you know, God, how did you do this? How did you create something so beautiful, so breathtaking? And, you know, I was thinking about this moment and I was thinking about this picture the other day when I was looking through just kind of my phone and stuff and reminiscing of that trip. And it made me think for a second, I was able to pause and kind of take in that, you know, that view. I had so many things to do that day, but this just captivated my attention and it made me think for me, how often do I pause? You know, I would ask the same question for you. For you, how often do you pause? And not pausing for the sake of pausing, not stopping for the sake of stopping, but specifically speaking, how often do you stop and just think about the gospel? How often do you pause and just take a moment to meditate on, to reflect on, and in your head, really just kind of mentally reflect, like reflect and, and, and in a deep way, just kind of internalize what Jesus accomplished for you on the cross? You know, I was thinking to myself so often, every day, there's so many things, and it's not these big, ginormous things, but small things that fight for my affection, that fight for my attention, and I give myself to these things over and over, whether it's work, whether it's small little tasks that I need to do, and before I know it, I lose the whole day, and you know, this could happen day after day, but how often do I, how often do we really just take a moment to pause and think about the gospel? To pause and think about, wow, Jesus, this is what you've done for me. You know, those gospel truths mentioning, that we mentioned earlier, how often do we think about those things that Jesus accomplished for us and how the good news is available to us? You know, Greg Gilbert, the author of the What is the Gospel book that we've been going through, has a quote that I felt just kind of perfectly kind of falls in line with the same thought process. He says this, he says, why do I so often organize and think of my life as if I were wearing blinders rather than in the light of eternity? Why does this gospel not permeate all the time and all the way to the bottom? My relationships with my wife and children, my coworkers and friends and my fellow church members. I know exactly why. It's because I'm a sinner and worldliness will continue to linger in my heart 
and war against me until the day Jesus comes back. But until then, I want to fight against that. I want to fight against spiritual laziness, against the drugged stupor this world threatens to put me in. And I want to embrace this gospel hard and let it affect everything. My actions, affections, emotions, desires, thoughts, and will. Man, I thought that was such a beautiful quote and such a well kind of encapsulated quote. But I really resonate what he said at the end, just being able to embrace the gospel hard and letting it affect everything. And when I think about, you know, today's kind of focus, talking about the power of the gospel, you know, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1.16 that he's unashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. This gospel, this good news that we have is powerful. I was thinking, you know, this gospel, the power of this gospel should affect so many areas of our life. And what I want to do today is as we kind of talk through this last message, wrapping up this series, we can't hit every topic, but we can hit some. And the some that we want to focus in on today, the few that we want to focus in on today, I really pray that the Holy Spirit speaks to you, that God speaks to you in a new, in a fresh way as we kind of talk through some of these ways that the gospel can really affect our life. And the first one that I was thinking of was that the gospel gives us the power to rest and rejoice. And what I mean is, is that our salvation, you know, when G- everything that Jesus accomplished and us being saved is not dependent on what we do. Our relationship with Christ isn't dependent on our ability to live righteously or to live right. Um, it's not dependent on our will that if it was, you know, my, my will is so fickle and so weak. I, I might be determined to try to be perfect or try to do right things for God, but I fail so often It's not dependent on that, but it's grounded on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. You know, because of Jesus's death and his resurrection, the Bible says in Romans 4 that we are justified. We're declared right before God. And I think sometimes it can be tempting to think in our imperfection, in our not being perfect, in our mistakes, that our salvation is somehow on the line. You know, I think sometimes it can be tempting to think that, You know, if we don't see the growth that we want to see in our life, sometimes we put expectations on ourselves that as a Christian, I should be at this point in X, Y, Z. I should be seeing A, B and C in my life. And because we it doesn't line up with the expectations that we have, sometimes that frustration can make us think and make us question our salvation, can make us question whether or not we're close to Christ. And the reason I even said this point is because the gospel gives us the power to rest to rest in the fact that Jesus made us right before him. It doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter if we feel distant from God, if we feel close to God. It's not about us. It's not about our emotions. Jesus declared us right before God. The Bible says that whoever calls on his name will be saved. There is a security in that. And because there's a security, we can rejoice in that fact. It's not dependent on our emotions. It's dependent on the truth of God's word. But when I say that, I don't say that to say that we can do whatever we want. You know, Paul says in Romans 6, verses 1 to 2, what should we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we who die to sin still live in it? You know, on one hand, it's not about what we do. It's about what Jesus has done. But on the other hand, that doesn't give us a license to do whatever we want. But out of an overflow of what Jesus has done, Our heart should desire to want to please him, to live in such a way that glorifies him. Our heart should desire to want to rest in the truth that we're saved because of his work on the cross. You know, I love Romans 8 verses 31 to 32 that says, what then are we we supposed to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also grant us everything? You know, for the believer, the cross of Jesus stands firm immovably testifying of God's love to us. And I love the later part of this verse where he says at the end of this verse, he says he did not even spare his own son who gave himself up for us. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Just shows how determined God is to get close to us. Just show how determined God is to show us how much he loves us. You know, we can rest and rejoice in what Jesus has done on our behalf. And that's an immovable truth that we can believe wholeheartedly. So the power of the gospel, the the gospel gives us the power to rest and rejoice. But the gospel also gives us the power 
to love God's people, the church. You know, when we when we hear the gospel, we hear the good news of Jesus. It should it should drive us to want to love God's people, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ deeper. You know what Jesus says in the gospel? He says, they will recognize you're my disciples, not by how many verses we have memorized, not by how many times we attend church on a Sunday, not by how many hours you spend reading your Bible. He says, they'll recognize you're my disciples by the way you love one another. And you know, Jesus really hammers this point in because in his prayer, in John 17, right before he gets arrested, right before he goes on the cross, some of his like final thoughts before the last moments of his life start taking place, he says this in John 17, verses 20 to 23. He says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as for you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be, so that they may be made one as we are one. I am in them and you were in me so that they may be completely one, that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them just as you have loved me. And I love the latter part of, the word, of this verse because he says, Jesus is basically saying, he says, I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one. He's talking about the church loving one another. Jesus is thinking about the church in his last moments, that we would be completely one, that love would be the glue that would unify us. And what does he say the purpose of that is? So that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You know, it made me think, I'm like, sometimes we we think of those people in our life that just don't know the Lord and we want to see them come to a relationship with God. We want to see them be saved to give their life to Jesus. And we think of all these strategies. We think of all these ways to maybe make Jesus more relevant. And we think of all these ways to be able to just kind of convince them to become Christians. But Jesus says the strongest evidence that he is real, that the strongest evidence that the work that he's done is, is, is so life changing and so powerful that he's real is that we would be unified. And that in the church being unified, in the church loving one another, the world would recognize that God has sent Jesus. It's such a powerful truth. The church loving one another is so much bigger than just us. It's so much bigger than just the church specifically. It can affect the entire world. And the world will look in and say, I want to be a part of that love. I want to be a part of what's going on there. The gospel gives us the power to love God's people, the church. And to get to that place where we do that, where we live that out on a day to day, It starts with reminding ourselves that it's not about our emotions. It's not about us. You know, I love Greg Gilbert said something in this book. He said, you know, we're not self-made citizens in God's kingdom. We're not we don't we don't earn our own salvation by works. We didn't get here on our own. It was through Jesus. So in the same way that we depended on Jesus for salvation, we depend on Jesus to be able to be the one to give us what we need to love one another in such a way that proves what he says in this verse. So the gospel gives us the power to love God's people, the church, but the gospel also gives you the power to proclaim the gospel. Now, I'm going to say something that might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but just being honest. In proclaiming the gospel and sharing the gospel and declaring the gospel, not everyone is going to repent. And not everyone who hears the gospel who hears you sharing this good news of Jesus we've been talking about the last couple weeks, is going to receive this and accept this. And that's okay. 1 Corinthians 1.18 talks about this truth. The Apostle Paul says this in regards to that. He says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. You know, I was thinking about this verse and I think sometimes it's so tempting to think when we're sharing the gospel and people are getting saved that we're doing everything right. And then sometimes the opposite is true. It's so tempting to think that when we're sharing the gospel and nobody's getting saved, that we're doing something wrong, that we're a failure. You know, how can we be messing this up? This is the good news of Jesus. Why isn't everybody getting saved? But the problem is, is that in both of those situations, neither one is truly representative of what success in sharing the gospel is. 
you know, talking, proclaiming the gospel, the, you having this power from the good news of Jesus to share the good news of Jesus. Success isn't just found in how many people are saved, but the success is just in sharing the gospel, in sharing the good news. That's the win. We can't change the heart of people. But if we're willing to step out boldly and to talk about the good news of Jesus, to talk about what he's done in our life, the Holy Spirit is the one who is faithful. The Holy Spirit is the one who will convict. The Holy Spirit is the one that will bring the other individual to a point of decision where they have to decide to receive Christ or to reject Christ. But our win as a believer in sharing the gospel is sharing it. You know, Greg Gilbert has this phenomenal quote about this topic. He says, if you are a Christian, realize that you hold in your hands the only true message of salvation the world will ever hear. There will never be another gospel. And there is no other way for people to be saved from their sins. There are many good things that we can do as Christians, but the fact is, is that most of the good things will happily also be done by people who are not Christians. But if we Christians fail to proclaim the gospel of Jesus... Who else is going to do that? No one. You know, good deeds, you know, serving one another. One of the things that I love, love about pe people that just love Jesus, Christians that love the Lord, is that we're just giving people. We're charitable, charitable people. We're serving people. We just want to bless other people. It's just that type of giving and charitable heart is so, is so beautiful. And good deeds have their place in the life of a believer. But they don't replace the sharing of the gospel. You know, the Bible says that faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. If anything, the moments that we get to serve somebody, the moments that we get to bless somebody, the moments that we get to, to be able to do these good deeds, so to speak, they set the stage for the plain sharing of the gospel, for the sharing of those gospel truths that we talked about earlier. So that other people can come to a place where when they hear that good news, the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit can bring them to that place of decision where they decide if they want to receive Christ or if they want to reject Christ. But I love this whole quote that Greg Gilbert was saying. You know, the gospel gives you the power to proclaim the gospel. The gospel also gives us the power to long for Jesus's return. The author also said this, he says, the great hope for Christians, the thing for which we long and for which we look for strength and encouragement is the day when our king will part the skies and return to establish his glorious kingdom finally and forever. That moment is when everything in this world will be set right, when justice will finally be done, evil overthrown forever and righteousness established once and for all. You know, it's such a beautiful picture. You know, as believers, we need hope. You know, Titus talks about this specific moment in time that the author is talking about. And he says that this is our blessed hope. You know, the author of Hebrews talks about this hope and he says that it's an anchor for our soul. And, you know, one of the coolest things is that we actually get a snippet of what this time is going to look like in God's presence when he comes and he makes all things new when when he brings that justice and it's found in Revelation 7 9 to 10 we get a nice little snippet he says after this I looked and I saw there was a vast multitude from every nation tribe people and language which no one can number standing before the throne in the lamb they were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our Lord who is seated on the throne and to the lamb what a beautiful picture that at the end, some of the things that divide us in this world, the, the different tribes, the different people groups, everybody's going to be in the same level, the same playing field in God's presence, worshiping God. As he does everything the author was saying in that quote. You know, I was thinking when I was thinking about this point, you know, giving an extreme generalization here, there's two types of people in the world. There's people that love spoilers and there's people that hate spoilers. And this is what I mean. There's people that they'll watch a show and they're, they're there or a movie for that first time experience. They want to watch that movie for the first time or that show. They want to take in every emotion. 
They want to take it frame by frame. They want to just enjoy all the twists and the turns. And there's other people that that thought makes them cringe. They want to know what happens at the end before even starting in the beginning. You know, I, I'm sure you can tell at this point where I stand. I love, love not knowing the spoilers. I love just going in blind and whether it's a season finale of a show or movie, just being surprised as I go. My wife, Marissa, she's the opposite. We'll watch a show. She's Googling the end of the show before we even start the show. I'm sitting there like, what's the point of it? But I think one of the cool things is that in Scripture, as Christians, we kind of get, we kind of know as followers of Christ how this whole thing ends. When you read the book of Revelation, you see how it ends. God gives us the spoilers of what the end of human history is going to look like, what the end of our lives is going to look like. We know what the end is before we get there. And just like we know how history begins in Genesis, and just like we know how it ends in Revelation, we get this picture that God is victorious, that in the end, God wins. And it gives us this hope. It gives us this security. And if we know how it ends, what do we do from now until that point? What do we do from now until either the end of our earthly lives or if Jesus comes back in our lifetime? What do we do up until that point? And I think honestly that the answer is simple, but it's not easy. We endure. We persevere. We choose daily to follow Jesus. But when we take a moment to pause and we take a moment to think about the gospel, to think about the good news, it puts us in a position where it gives us the power to long for Jesus's return, where our perspective isn't just about the problems or about the things that we're facing now, but we're looking at the future. We're looking at the spoilers. We're seeing how this whole thing ends and putting everything in perspective in light of that. But going alongside of this, I know we've talked about so many areas that, you know, the gospel has the power to affect, but I think this last one is... <laughs> Is, is powerful as well. The gospel gives us the power to conquer. And I want to elaborate what I mean by that. When speaking of conquering, some translations in the verses we're about to look at, uh, they say overcome. And what I mean specifically by this is when I'm referencing conquering, I'm referencing overcoming, is essentially enduring in the daily struggle against our flesh, enduring in the daily struggle against our sin, and enduring in this, in this daily struggle, this day in and day out against Satan. And this is what I mean specifically by this. As a believer, sin isn't something we should embrace. As a believer, sin isn't something we should be at peace with. That has to be a red flag to us. Sin is something we should be at war with. The sin in us is something that should be constantly displeasing us, constantly something that unsettles us. This flesh that we have, you know, that... that we're so tempted and so swayed to kind of do things disconnected from God's word that's against God's word. This flesh that we have isn't just something that we give into, but we submit it and discipline it to godly living. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 9. You know, the Bible says that Satan himself isn't an enemy to ignore, but Peter says it in 1 Peter 5 that he's like a prowling lion looking for those to devour. So every day in choosing to follow Jesus and to live for him, we go in opposition against our flesh. We go in opposition against sin. We go in opposition against Satan. So with this opposition, what does it mean when, we say, when I say that the, power, the gospel gives the power to conquer? I think, Revelation 20, I think Revelation 12, 11 gives a beautiful definition of that. And Revelation 12, 11 says this, that they conquered him by the blood of the lamb, and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. And I love the end of this verse because it says that they, did not, they did not love their lives to the point of death, meaning that their flesh, their lives, they put to death. You know, the, the, John the Baptist said it this way. He said, may I decrease and God, may you increase. The Apostle Paul said it this way. He says, I crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. In, in the believer's minds, the they that it's talking about is the church. The church conquered by, 
you know, they didn't think much about their lives. To them, what mattered most was Jesus. And it says that they conquered him by the blood of the lamb. What does it mean by the blood of the lamb? It's talking about the substitutionary atonement that we learned a couple weeks back. When we learned of how Jesus took our place on the cross, how his blood was shed to the point of him dying so that we could have eternal life in him. They conquered by the truth of what Jesus did on the cross and by the word of their testimony. You know, the book of Acts says that we are God's witnesses. And what do witnesses do? All witnesses do is they they speak of everything that they see and they hear. And the church conquered him, speaking of Satan, speaking the evil one, they conquered him by the truth of, of, the, of the gospel, what Jesus accomplished on the cross, and by the sharing of what Jesus had done in their life. And I thought this was so powerful, this truth, because you kind of get an example and you get a picture of this in the book of Revelation itself. You know, this struggle, this tension isn't something that's new. It's something that has been around. It's something that, has, that will be around. The struggle against sin, the struggle against the flesh, the struggle against Satan, and, and just this constant battle. But I love in Revelation 2 to 3, there's these seven churches that Jesus himself is speaking to specifically. And the Apostle John, as the author of Revelation, is just writing down what Jesus is saying to them. Jesus is speaking to them directly and speaking to the situations, some good and some not so good situations. But he's speaking to them and kind of telling them, you know, if they were to conquer, if they were to endure the struggles that they're facing, some of the things that they may inherit, some of the things that they may receive. And I kind of put a little bit of this chart together to try to make some sense of what, of what Jesus said to these churches. But he speaks to the church of Ephesus. And I love these verses because it's a reminder to these churches at the time, but it's a reminder to us believers that we don't endure for the sake of enduring. It's not conquering for the sake of conquering. There's a bigger picture ahead. There's something bigger than just the thing, than just enduring day to day. He says to the church of Ephesus, he says to all these churches, to, if, if they have an ear to hear, to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. He says to the one who conquers, in Revelation 2, 7 to the church of Ephesus, he says, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. What does he mean when he says that? He's referencing the end of Revelation. He's referencing kind of a picture of the Garden of Eden, of where God restores all things and makes them new. This whole eating from the tree of life is a picture of salvation, is a picture of being with Jesus. Jesus says if the church of Ephesus were to endure with everything they were struggling with, that they would get to experience that salvation, that being with Jesus for all eternity. It's such a beautiful, beautiful picture. To the church of Smyrna, he says in Revelation 2.11, he says, to the one that conquers, he will never be harmed by the second death. You know, Revelation paints this picture that at the end, when Jesus comes back, he's going to be reigning and ruling for this thousand year period. And then he deals with evil swiftly. There is this second death, so to speak, this judgment where he once and for all deals with evil. He deals with Satan. He deals with those that have rejected the gospel. The Bible says it this way. Those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And they're given this, this final, eternal kind of judgment or punishment, so to speak. But what is Jesus promising? This is a church that was persecuted. This is a church that was suffering. He says, look, if you conquer, if you endure, if you keep going, you don't have to worry about that judgment. He's once again assuring them that in their enduring, in their choosing to keeping to follow Jesus, that they're going to have that eternity with Christ secure in him. He says to the church of Pergamum, Revelation 2.17, he says, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name is inscribed. And when he says that, it's a reference back to Isaiah 62. But the whole thought is, is that this church, as they endure, as to the one that conquers, they would be sealed to God. That God will seal them to himself. He'll give them a new name. They're going to be with them. There's this security. You know, he says to the church of Thyatira, they had this reputation of being just this pagan church just all over the place. He says, I will give them authority over the nations. It's this picture of that thousand year reign that they get to rule with Jesus. They get to be with Jesus in his presence. To the church of Sardis, they had a reputation of being a dead church. You know, they, they met and they gathered, but, but it was like dead, like there was no life to it. And he says in Revelation 3, 5 to 6, that to the one that conquers, he'll be dressed in white clothes. And I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge him. You know, where did we just read that? 
in that verse in Revelation, what were all the people that were worshiping God wearing white clothes? So it was a reference that as they conquer, as they endure, what's the end goal in mind? That they get to be worshiping Jesus in his presence forever. It's the same validation, that same encouragement, that same blessing that they get to partake in. You get to see a glimpse at the end of Revelation 2 to the church of Philadelphia. This church that was on the right path, doing the right things. He says, I will make a pillar to those who conquer in the temple of my God. And I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God and my new name. He's talking to them how if they endure, if they conquer, if they just keep going, if they just keep pressing, if they don't give up, that they get to spend that eternity with God. The Bible calls it the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and new earth, that they get to be in that city with him, that they get to dwell with Jesus. And to the church of Laodicea, he says in Revelation 3, 21 to 22, this church had a reputation for being lukewarm. They weren't all in for Jesus, but they weren't all out for Jesus. They were just kind of this weird hybrid in between. They didn't really make a decision and they, they, they were just considered lukewarm. He says, to those who conquer, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. This picture again of that thousand year period and as well in the new heaven and new earth that they get to rule with Jesus, they get to be with Jesus. And what's the point of all these blessings? That all these churches were facing something. All these churches were going through something. And they had to make that decision to endure. They had to make that decision that when they were confronted with their sin, with their flesh, or sometimes they might have been doing the right things, but it was Satan opposing them. They had to decide, were they going to keep following Jesus? And Jesus gave them all an encouragement. Jesus gave them all this, this blessing that would be available to them and said, to those that conquer, to those that keep going, that overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, all these things will be available to them. And I think the beautiful thing is, is that, yes, Jesus was speaking directly to these churches, but the word of God is living and active. Yes, he was speaking directly to these churches, but the word of God is God breathed. So it's truths that were true for these churches, but it's truths that are true for us. And when the churches got the book of Revelation and they saw the hope that they get to experience with Jesus at the end, man, it just made me think, I could imagine being in their shoes, hearing of some of these blessings and getting so fired up. It's like having gas in their tank to want to keep going, to want to keep pressing in, to want to keep following Jesus. And I think it should have the same effect with us. The gospel gives us the power to conquer and not just for the sake of conquering, but to be able to be with Jesus for all eternity. For all eternity. Now, one of the things I thought that was interesting was that when Jesus said this to all these churches, he didn't say to all the saints. He didn't say to all the believers. What he said was, was to the one that conquers. It kind of implies that he was speaking to some, but that he wasn't speaking to all. It was this, this like verbiage of like, it was almost like conditional, like meaning that some would get it, but some won't get it. That it was for those that endured to the end of their earthly lives. You know, Jesus says in, in Matthew 7, I don't have these verses up, but he says that there, there are some that at the end here, they stand before his presence and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. There's another portion in the Gospels where it says at the, end of, at the end of their lives, some people stand before God's presence and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And, you know, when I think of these verses and I think of him saying to the one who conquers, it's kind of like when he's giving that condition, he's like he's giving an option. He's like, we have an option. The gospel gives us the power to be able to live in such a way that we glorify Jesus and get to spend forever with him. And we can receive that and we can live in that or we can choose to reject that. And I think one of the most, one of these, so, such a cool scripture and a powerful scripture. In Revelation twenty two seventeen, it's one of the last verses in the entire Bible. But it's kind of like the author of Revelation Gives his perspective and he says, both the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. He says, both the spirit and the bride say, come. Almost speaking like from a future tense, both the Holy Spirit and the church of this bride, of the church at the time say, like, come. It's like what they're experiencing is so good. Their response, like having experienced God's presence is, 
You, you just have to be a part of this. Come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Like, if you hear the good news of Jesus, you can't help but want to tell other people, come. Like, there's something uh, so powerful about the gospel, something so powerful about how this, how this all ends, that that's the response. But I love the heart of Jesus that you see in the scripture. He says, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life, take, let the one who desires take the water of life freely. That being symbolic of eternal life in Jesus. And the reason I share this verse is because the response of the Holy Spirit, the response of the church, after giving these seven churches the, hind, the spoiler of what would happen if they're faithful to Jesus, that's kind of something we can hold on to as well, is they can't help but want to extend that invitation to whoever's reading. And I think for all of us reading and all of us hearing this verse, maybe there's some of you that are listening and, man, you just want Jesus. You know, the last couple of weeks you spent some time hearing what the gospel is and, and you just want Jesus. Maybe there's some of you hearing today's message and hearing how the, God, the gospel has this power to affect these different areas of our life. You just want Jesus. Maybe there's some of you that you've been following the Lord for years, but you haven't seen the power of the gospel affect these areas of your life. But you're hungry and you're thirsty to want to see God do that work in your life. He says, let the one who desires take the water of life freely to, to draw near to God. There's a verse in James 4 that says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The whole idea is, is that God is inviting you to come to him. All we need to do is take that step. So what I want to do is I just want to take a moment and I want to pray really quick. And I mean, I would encourage you, if you've never had that opportunity, if you've never placed your, 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 your faith and your trust in the Lord, I would encourage you from wherever you might be listening to this message, I would encourage you, that's the best decision you can make. Man, I would encourage you the same way that Jesus encouraged some of these churches to keep enduring, to keep trusting that the gospel has the power to allow you to conquer sin, to conquer the flesh, to conquer Satan. And there's such a beautiful reward at the end of it all. And I love how Revelation pictures and paints all of that. So let's just take a moment and let's pray together. God, I just thank you so much for who you are. Lord, thank you that Father, that we could just take this opportunity just to be able to wrap up the series talking about how your gospel, Lord, has the power to just affect every area of our life. God, your, your gospel has the power to for, to for us to be able to rest and rejoice in the truth of what your son has done for us. Father, your, your gospel gives us the power to love your people, the church. It gives us the power to proclaim the good news. Your gospel gives us the power to long for Jesus' return. Your power gives us the power to conquer. And God, I pray that for anybody that's watching now, God, I pray that you would do this work in our life. I pray as we draw near to your presence, as we come closer to you, Lord, will we see these truths in our life? Will we make decisions to rest in you, to rejoice in you? Will we make the decision to, to love your church, to proclaim the gospel, and to have a mindset that's beyond what we're facing now, but into eternity? God, we love you, and we come to you responding the way the author in Revelation at the end encourages us to respond. We just come to you, Jesus. We come to you. Thirsty and hungry for more of your presence, we just come to you. Lord, we give you all the honor, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.